All right, we have a double doozy. Actually, we almost have it's almost like three people on the show because we have authors uh, Ruben Uriarte and Noe Torres of Roswell Books, and then uh, we've got some clips from their witness who had this incredible encounter, which is the topic of their latest book, Aliens in the Forest: The Cisco Grove UFO Encounter. So, welcome Noe and Ruben back to the show. Yes, thank you very much for having us today, Alejandro. We're so pleased to be on to talk about this remarkable case. And uh, I'm also very happy that my colleague and dear friend Ruben is with us. Thank you, uh, Noe. Uh, just fighting. I'm a little bit under the weather, so I, I apologize. But um, we've got a plan A there, and um, we have lots of uh, audio clips and narration to share. So I hope the audience will find it find this case very interesting. I'm sure they will. So, yeah, too bad you're under the weather. But luckily, we're all in the southern part of the country, so we're all enjoying better weather than most of our listeners probably. It's like 80 degrees here today. It's so nice. I've got the windows open. There's a nice breeze. Noah, you're in Texas, right? Yes, I'm in South Texas along the border, and we're having really good weather also. We're in about the 60s, and we've got the windows open, nice, fresh, cool air. It's sunny, and we're just enjoying the weather here. Oh, I wish I wish I was there with you guys right now because our weather, I live here in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's a little overcast, gray, and cold. Mm, you're a little too far north, I guess, huh? Yes. <laughs> well, just take it easy up there. So let's get into your your latest book. Of course, we've had you guys on before to talk about some of your other um, projects you've worked on. But real quick, I guess, Noe, before we get into your latest book, I haven't talked to you since you've done uh, this one kind of based off of Cowboys and Aliens, the movie called The Real Cowboys and Aliens, where you did a, a book with uh, John LeMay on UFO incidents, like in the real old West. Yes, uh, actually that book has been very, very successful for us. Uh, John LeMay, who's a historian in Roswell, New Mexico, and works for the uh, Historical Society there, he contacted me shortly after the announcement from uh, Spielberg's group that the movie uh, Cowboys and Aliens was going to be made. He contacted me and said, you know, people are going to be focused on this topic, and a lot of folks don't realize that there were actual encounters between people in the Old West in 1800s U.S. and aliens or uh, UFOs. So um, so he and I started working on this project early on before the Spielberg movie, you know, was was completed and released. And um, we worked for that uh, for about a year on the book and we compiled hundred. We looked at hundreds of cases from the 1800s where uh, various uh, ranchers and townspeople from the Old West, cowboys in several cases, actually encountered extraterrestrials. And it was a fascinating book to research and put together. John did a fantastic job. We had uh, great contributions from uh, John's friend, Neil Reby, who is a, a really a world-famous illustrator and, and did the illustrations for the book. And, and as I say, we've just been so uh, knocked out by all the tremendous response uh, to our book, The Real Cowboys and Aliens. We, we speak a lot at schools and at gatherings of educators. Um, it's been very, very um, uh, popular among the middle school to high school age group, and we kind of targeted it at that level. And recently it was uh, added to one of the main lists that's used for ordering books in, in the school, in the school districts, which has given our sales a big boost. Cool. And it's also uh, under consideration for being included in the Accelerated Reader Program, awesome. which is another program that's used in the school districts a lot. So, yeah, thank you for asking about that. It, it was a very good uh, book for us. Yeah, that that's really cool. It sounds exciting. Is there... Um, before we move on, just real quick, one kind of really cool story, maybe from a famous cowboy or a, a story which in particular people like? Probably the one that we get the most comments about. And in the book, we have a chapter for each specific case. We picked 
We picked about 14 cases that really seemed above all the others in terms of credibility, documentation, um, and we're fairly confident that these incidents happen now as to what the actual explanation was. You know, nobody knows for sure, but these are documented cases. And the one that we get a lot of comments about is the 1897 crash of an unidentified flying object in the Fort Worth, Texas area in a small town called Aurora. And many of your listeners are probably familiar with it, but we uh, gathered together as much data as we could, and we did a chapter on this strange object that struck a windmill, fell in the middle of town uh, in a big pile of wreckage. The people came out to look. They found a body amidst the wreckage. Uh, the newspaper accounts of the day say that it was not a human. Uh, it was humanoid, but it was not a human. They called it a man from Mars or a man from the moon. Of course, this is the 1800s, and people, you know, don't don't have the scientific advances that we have today. And uh, unfortunately, that that uh, occupant of that crashed UFO was dead at the time that they found him. And so um, wanting to give it a proper Christian burial, uh, the townspeople gathered up the body, you know, prepared it and put it there in the town cemetery, where this very day, people can travel from all over the world, and they do, to Aurora, Texas, a tiny little town population of under 100 people in the Fort Worth area, and they can see a state of Texas historical marker plaque that's been placed there in front of the town, the old town cemetery that mentions the reported crash of a spaceship and the burial of its only occupant in the town cemetery in 1897. It's a fascinating case, and people just love it when we uh, speak to groups. They love hearing uh, about that particular case. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting case. So, And just so the listeners know, they can go to roswellbooks.com to get that book or any of the books we're talking about, including your latest, Aliens in the Forest. So how did you all come across this story? Uh, I'm going to ask Ruben to, to uh, speak on this one because he's the one that made the initial contact with the eyewitness in this case. And all of this came about through some great materials that he inherited when he became uh, the director for the Mutual UFO Network in Northern California. Then he eventually acquired the files, all the wonderful documents, the reports, the photographs, the letters that were mailed back and forth, audio tapes. So he basically had this wealth of information about this case. So, Ruben, can you fill in some more on how that initial contact happened? Sure. Uh, there was a, an investigator now th that was involved in this case, Alejandro, back in 1964 is when the event happened, and I, I believe it was in 65 that Mr. Paul Cerny, who was with NICAP at the time, got involved in doing the investigation. And um, we'll be going into more of the story, but as Noe had mentioned, I was very fortunate to had come across all these files and that as uh, – I uh, was the assistant state director for Northern California, and when um, Mr. Paul Cerny, who's no longer who's no longer with us, uh, he passed away in November of 2000. Um, I gradually started acquiring some of his great cases, and then there was one in particular that just struck me um, about the bow and arrow cases, as it was referred, and with that, I said to myself, I would love to meet this man someday. And through another colleague of mine, I was able to meet with him in person, him and his family. They uh, invited me to their home. I was there for about two days and was very, very fortunate to do another, uh, an in-depth interview with them. Uh, their son happened to record everything on video, which, was, which has turned in, invaluable to us. And their goal, uh, Alejandro, was to – they wanted to see this story – Put into a book, and the real story. There's been variations of it told over the years in different articles and that, but never the real, true, complete story. And so I was very fortunate, of course, to have connected with Noe, and we then made this into a book. Cool, yeah. And it sounds like, I mean, from these clips, you got enough to it. I mean, it's, you know, I think a lot of people think, "Wow, 
a whole book on one case, of course, it's happened before, but uh, a lot happened in this this uh, encounter. Well, it is it is actually one of the most uh, incredible and well documented UFO cases of the 1960s. Until Ruben brought it to my attention, I, like many other people, had never really heard about this case. But it turns out that this is one of three cases that was very highly thought of by Dr. J. Ellen Hynek and Dr. James Harder, who were two of the leading UFO investigators of the 60s and 70s. They were looking at three cases that had a preponderance of evidence and were they considered to be highly credible. That was the Betty and Barney Hill abduction of 1961, which most of your listeners I'm sure are familiar with. The Pascagoula, Mississippi uh, UFO incident of 1973, and there was also the Travis Walton abduction in 1975. Now, all three of those cases have a lot of tie-ins and similarities to um, to the Don Shrum uh, Cisco Grove encounter that we're going to talk about on this show. But especially the Barney and Betty Hill and the Pascagoula, Mississippi incident. Uh, as well as this this Cisco Grove encounter, these were the big three uh, that Dr. Dr. Hynek and Dr. Harder looked at very closely and and held in very high esteem. Uh, now, the the main reason that a lot of folks hadn't heard about this case and haven't is because the principal eyewitness, Don Shrum, was at the time working for a missile defense contracting firm in Sacramento, California, called the Aerojet. Corporation. Now, they were the main manufacturers of missiles, uh, including the Polaris and the Titan missile. And so when he had this UFO encounter while hunting with some of his buddies on a weekend, uh, you know, he didn't want to come out in public because of the sensitive nature of his of his employers, you know, the situation with his job. Uh, being uh, of a sensitive nature and involved with uh, making missiles for the for the government, so therefore he was um, he was never his identity was never released until now. It's only been in the past couple of years in the preparation and writing of this book that he's finally agreed to come out and tell his story. Uh, with all the names of, of the people that were there with him on that day, his hunting companions and himself. And for the first time, we have the whole story um, to this case, which, as I as I started off by saying, it's one of the most significant UFO cases of the 1960s. Yeah, well, the people you mentioned are very conservative researchers, so it says a lot if they uh, felt that this was a credible case. What are some of the things, why, what makes this case so credible or, or this witness? Well, we can, have spent, go ahead, uh, go ahead Ruben, because you've spent all this time uh, with the Shrums, and you can speak to their high level of sincerity and credibility. Well, the, a couple of things that we found this case to be really quite unique is the fact that, unlike other uh, abduction cases, this was a a, an apparent attempt to capture him by these species of, of beings. And he fought them off for about 12 hours uh, in, in a, and went through a great ordeal. And what we found most unusual is that fact that uh, he, how he kept himself uh, from being, being taken and, and not at the same time he used his wits. Uh, he was a very resourceful man. The other thing I'd like to add is um, the fact that we had so much interesting documentation from NICAP, uh, from from the Paul's personal uh, files, as well as the Shrums. Uh, they kept they can compiled so many of uh, a doc document. We we had the, the great fortune of acquiring those so we could put together this book. The the, the other thing is that the fact that this is a, is a historical case and. But as you know, Noe and I have been looking in various historical cases because we feel that that there's so much real truth, real disclosure is in our past. So this is one of the reasons why we wanted to focus on this and and and, and tell this this man is still alive, him and his family, and the fact uh, 
to educate the, the public on this really fascinating case. Cool. It's exciting. So let's get into the story. So how did it all start for this gentleman? It, it, it's unique <laughs> you know, how it all began and what he was up to when, when it all started. Yes. Uh, Mr. Don Shrum, back in September of 1964, as I mentioned, was working for the Aerojet Corporation, which was the nation's leading missile defense contractor for the U.S. government. And he and two other gentlemen from his workplace um, decided that they were going to go out hunting, deer hunting, uh, and it wasn't rifle season yet for hunters in that area of California. Um, they were going to go bow hunting with bow and arrow. So he and two buddies um, went out um, to the Tahoe National Forest, which is located east of Sacramento, um, near the um, California-Nevada uh, state, you know, boundary. And so they went out to an area called, um, that's known as Cisco Grove, California. And it's right there in the Tahoe uh, National Forest. So they went early in the day on a Friday. They had a three-day weekend. They went early in the day, and they spent most of the day um, looking, you know, hunting, um, and it was getting toward evening, and the three became separated from each other. They, threw, they took three different routes through the wilderness. And this was a very rugged and isolated uh, part of, of the area, the wilderness area. And it, it's not a place that's frequented by campers or hikers. It, they were pretty much pretty far out there. So the three became separated. Mr. Shrum went up along a ridge and one of the other hunters was on the opposite side of the ridge. You know, there was a big divide or ravine between them. And then the third hunter was down below at the at the bottom of the canyon. So Mr. Shrum thought that um, when, he would, when he was going to get to the end of this ridge that he was walking alongside of, that he, there'd be a way that he could cross over and rejoin his companion on the other side. But it turned out that there wasn't. So he had to backtrack and um, heading back to camp, which was a couple of miles away from, from his position there when he realized he had to backtrack, he realized that it was getting dark. It was already nearly dark. And prior to uh, going out hunting, he had heard that there was a lot of bear activity uh, that had been reported. Hunters had run into bear there in, the, uh, in that area. So he was concerned about that. Also, he was not really familiar with this specific place. They had gone hunting out uh, other places before, but he was a little bit unfamiliar with the territory, the terrain. So the fact that it was it would soon be dark, there were predators, including possibly bear in the area, prompted him to seek a place of shelter for the night rather than try to stumble through the rocky, ravine-filled area in the dark and try to find his way back to camp. So this is a strategy that hunters sometimes ad uh, adopt when they are separated from their hunting companions in the dark in, in an isolated area. They look for a place of shelter to hole up for the night. And he did that. And what he decided to do was he decided to go up into a tree. Uh, it was actually a pine tree. And he was going to rest and spend the night up there in the pine tree. Uh, he had a military-style belt that he could uh, latch on to one of the larger branches up there. And uh, he could safely spend the night uh, safe from predators. And so that's what he did. Well, he was up there in that perch, and it was getting dark, when all of a sudden he noticed a very strange light headed his way. And that was the first appearance of a very uh, large UFO that we call the mothership, which appeared first. And that's audio clip number 150, Alejandro, if you could uh, press play on that one, and we'll listen to him describing the appearance of the ship. Okay, great. I'll play that right now. Here it goes. And then I saw a light. It looked like a lantern going up and down a trail. 
but then it came over the over the, over the top of a tree, and I got kind of excited then because I thought it was a, a helicopter from the Forest Service, and uh, I, I I stood between two of the fires that I built on the on the rocks and waved my arms and yelled and screamed and and uh, finally uh, that light started coming towards me so I was really relieved then because I thought it was a helicopter still until it got within oh maybe 60 feet or yards I'm not sure the distance at night uh, but it just stood hovered there with no sound so then I panicked because I didn't know it was no helicopter. I thought it was something from outer space. But it looked like all I could see is a little, about an eight inch glow. So I thought it was just a little tiny, <laughs> you know, flying saucer. And then I, uh, I kind of panicked and I threw my bow up in the tree again and Hand walked out there that limb and got up in the tree, and I had all camouflage clothing on, so I figured, well, they won't see me here, you know. But then this this light went a half circle around me over the canyon. Then I could see the whole the shadow of the whole uh, spacecraft. And it was, that was just a, a light that was on the nose of it. Wow, that's interesting. I mean, he uh, he unfortunately called attention to himself because he thought it was a helicopter. And and uh, these guys came to, to check him out. And unfortunately, it wasn't who he thought it was. That's right. He, in fact, he mentioned setting, having set two fires at the base of the tree. Uh, there were some flat rocks. It's a very rocky area. And uh, he actually gathered together some brush. He, he had a lot of boxes of matches with him, which come into play later on in the episode. Uh, but anyway, he set fire. He set two separate fires, one on top of uh, each of the rocks there, two flat rocks that were there. And so uh, he did everything in his uh, power to attract the attention, uh, uh, thinking that this was a helicopter that was sent from the Forest Service that, he, he thought that his friends uh, had realized that he had gotten separated from them and had contacted the rangers and that they had sent out a helicopter. But then he saw this immense object, uh, which he later described as being approximately 150 feet from stern to bow. If you can imagine that immense size of this object it was like a 14-story building turned on its side side it was cigar shaped had a very dark hull and had this strange light at the front end of it which he described as a headlight and a most impressive size uh for for a ufo if you can imagine yeah that's humongous that had to be quite a sight so the next thing that happens is uh, he's watching this and he notices that, you know, the hull looks kind of dark at first. And in fact, all the only thing he sees is this light at the front end of it. But then all of a sudden, these three lighted rectangular panels appear in the middle of the hull, evenly spaced, uh, three large windows uh, or portals. And um, so suddenly, you know, the side of this large mothership takes on this extra characteristic of having these three panels. And out of the centermost panel, an, another object, a smaller flying object, zooms out and drops down to the canyon below. As we're about to hear in the next clip that we're going to listen to, the appearance of this smaller ship, which we call the scout ship. Um, it, where uh, the eyewitness, Don Shrum, describes how it appeared and what happened afterward. Okay, so this is 200? Yes. 
All right, here we go. And then I saw three panels of light, like windows or whatever. And uh, they, uh, I saw a flash come from the bottom of the center one and just saw a dark object go down it to, in the canyon and then I lost track of it. And uh, then the next thing I saw was, saw a little blinking light up on the top of originally where the, the first one came from. This object that you first saw that left the, the, the uh, center panel, what did it look like, Don? Well, at that time, all I saw was a flash and saw a dark object go down. The dark object, what, it, what, it kind of, what shape was it? Well, I couldn't really say. It, was, it went so fast. But then I, I saw when it landed up on the, up on the ridge that it, uh, I could see uh, like a, a half, I could only see part of the top, but it had a little light on it and uh, looked like a, the top of a flying saucer really? that I'd seen in pictures. Uh, like a dome? Or yes, a... yeah, like a dome. And then, uh, I, so I kept my eyes on that. So at this point, I'm, I'm wondering, what was his state of mind? I mean, was it fearful at this point, or was it just fascination? He had in his mind the thought that uh, he could somehow hide. Um, he, he had climbed back into the tree, and he was dressed all in camouflage from head to toe, and he was, you know, he tried to lose himself among the branches, the upper branches of the tree. He was hoping that although he had called their attention, you know, earlier, that perhaps they would not see him there. He was greatly concerned, though, uh, because the appearance of the smaller ship, uh, it came closer to his position. Um, and uh, he was starting to become uh, somewhat concerned by the turn of events. Uh, but the but the point at which he became very gravely concerned was with what happened next, which was shortly after the smaller ship came out of the middle panel from the mothership and then zoomed close to a position where uh, Mr. Shrum was, where the tree was, then he suddenly heard some noises in the brush that seemed to be growing louder and coming toward him. And in this next uh, clip that we're going to hear, which is clip number 250, he gets his first look at the ETs uh, that have come out of the smaller uh, scout ship that landed nearby. So if you could roll that clip, Alejandro, then we'll listen to this incredible description. And uh, and I heard some thrashing through the brush in probably five, ten minutes these two humanoids come out of the brush and they kind of broke some of the brush off and and uh, was looking at it. And then they came straight underneath the tree and looked up at me. And I, I knew right then I was fingered. <laughs> they found you. <laughs> yeah, they found me. What, and, can you describe them for us? Tell us briefly what they Yeah, were. they were looked like uh, four or five feet. Of course, I'm looking down at them, so they, they'd be shorter than they probably are. And uh, they had a silvery, like a one-piece uh, suit on, and it seemed like it had the, the joints, puffy joints, you know, on the shoulders and the, and the elbows, and, and the legs I didn't see that clear. The humanoids, um, what did they, were you able to see their faces? No, uh, it was just a kind of a dark shadow. I could see the the two, uh, like eyes that were, uh, I like, looked like welding goggles to me. They were the same as welding goggles. And then the rest of the face was kind of a uh, blur. I couldn't see looking down at them. You're, you're able to see then the, the very was it large or small? They're 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 about two inches in diameter. 
it reminded me just like I said, like a w- welding goggle. Hmm. Very strange. So we we've, we've got in our book, Alejandro, we've got a number of sketches. We have some sketches that were done by Mr. Shrum shortly after his encounter. Hmm. And then we've got some enhancements to that. We've had uh there's been some professionally done sketches including some sketches done just this year uh, by artist Neil Reby, um, very excellent, uh, based on Mr. Shrum's description of these strange beings. Um, The thing that caught his attention most of all was these dark, circular eyes. Um, In fact, uh, for years after this event, Mr. Shrum would wake up with screaming nightmares. Wow. and he would his wife reported him uh waking up in the middle of the night and screaming saying those eyes those eyes referring to those dark unearthly eyes of these humanoids that seemed to um probe into his mind and seemed to be trying to gain uh, later on in the encounter uh they seemed to be probing into his mind trying to gain the upper hand on him as the story goes on. Uh, and so, did you want to hear the next clip? Well, let, let me set the stage for the next okay. clip, clip by saying that his troubles were actually only beginning with the arrival of the humanoids because there was a distinctly different uh, type of creature that appeared next, which ended up being much more threatening and menacing to him. Uh, This second creature was a bulkier or larger looking creature that Mr. Shrum um, described as a robot, although it could have been a humanoid dressed in a bulkier type of suit. Uh, He's not completely certain, but the overall impression of it was that it was robot-like, which incidentally, in a lot of UFO cases, the uh, ETs that are seen by witnesses, sometimes they're given um, characteristics of robots or mechanical beings. So it's not an unusual uh, thing in UFO cases. But anyway, uh, in this next clip, uh, Mr. Shrum describes this second type of being that suddenly appears on the scene, and this is when things get really, really dicey for him. And then, uh, then I saw uh, two flashing red orange light eyes come just picking its way down the ridge, just between the rocks and and around them and everything, and come down and was on the this big boulder, this big flat rock uh and then uh he kind of looked up at me and he and he uh moved his hand into in, the, in this, through the fire cinders and kind of scattered them and the uh, the eyes of this other uh, creature like uh the robot what what did that look like to you and it had uh kind of like fire it's kind of a orangish reddish orange or yellowish orange uh and they it kind of flickered like fire and they're about the same diameter as uh, about two inches in diameter as the humanoids wow and this is just so strange too that you know this wave and uh of of humanoids and it sounds like this second humanoids are kind of more of what's on the cover of the book yes the the um smaller beings on the cover of the book are the humanoids represent the humanoids okay and then the larger uh being that's trailing behind them represents the robot and in, mm. in that artistic impression okay. of them and the interesting thing, Alejandro, is that there was communication going on be- between these beings and their craft. Uh, Mr. Uh, Shrum 
felt that they were using various forms of audible and visible communication uh, during this encounter. Um, he heard these audible noises, which could have been mistaken for uh, owls, the hooting of owls or the cooing of birds, but it seemed that every time there was a an audible signal that he heard that sounded like this, then the behavior of the creatures would would change. They would they would start doing something else. Like for at one in one instance, he heard these sounds, and then the humanoids started to attempt to climb the tree. So he felt that there was communication. There was also uh, visual communication because he saw flashes of light passing between um, these creatures. And so apparently there was communication going on. Um, the other thing is, while all of this is unfolding below him uh, at the base of the tree, these creatures are approaching him. Um, he became, of course, he, he realized that they knew that he was there. They knew his uh, of his presence. And he was very, very concerned because as as events unfolded, it became clear to him that they were trying to capture him, uh, possibly uh, to use him as a specimen for experimentation. He had a very bad feeling about what their intent was. And Reuben has spent a lot of time with the principal eyewitness, Mr. Shrum. And uh, I wonder, Reuben, if you would tell us, about how Mr. Shrum reacts even all these many years after this happened whenever he starts talking about his encounter with these beings. Thank you, Billy. Um, I had to disconnect this microphone to get past my coughing phase here. But nope, you're a little low, Ruben. Okay, how about now? How about now? Still pretty quiet. How about, how well, we can, we can come back to Ruben uh, while he gets that microphone working, if you want, Alejandro. Okay. Uh, I I'll just say that uh, when Ruben has spent time talking to Mr. Shrum and his family, uh, Mr. Shrum still becomes highly disturbed and agitated. And I saw that in the video uh, interviews that Ruben conducted with Mr. Shrum. He becomes very tense and starts to kind of shake. His eyes become watery as he recounts what it, it was like for him to be up in that tree, suddenly surrounded by these creatures. And um, so in this next clip, we're going to hear the incredible story of what happens when the attack against them actually begins. Um, and it begins in a very subtle manner. The creature that he refers to as a robot stepped up to the base of the tree and then emitted a strange vapor that drifted up into the tree and caused Mr. Shrum to black out. And that's the next clip we're going to hear. That's, that's clip number 350. Then he come down uh, up on the rock. He was about seven feet from me. And uh, then he he touched his mouth and uh, kind of a steam vapor come out of his mouth and it lit up his face so I could see some detail. And then... Uh, I blacked out when that steam hit me, or I guess it was. It was kind of kind of took the the air from me, and I'd gasp for air and then black out, and I fell over my bow. And that's the only thing that kept me in the tree. And then, uh, so I figured they were out to get me then. So things started turning ugly. We figure that the vapor that was um, sent up to him was some type of asphyxiant, uh, and that's a category of gases that basically what they do is they um, 
suck up all the oxygen content from the surrounding air. Uh, typical asphyxiants are nitrogen, argon, and helium. So even though they're not toxic, they won't damage human tissue, they could still possibly be lethal mm -hmm. because if, if all the oxygen is removed from the air, a person will suffocate eventually. But in this case, there was only a small cloud of it causing Mr. Shrum to just black out momentarily. But the problem was that these creatures kept doing this over and over to him over the course of the many hours that night that he, that he spent battling these creatures. So it happened over and over that they would, you know, the robot would move close below him, would emit another burst of vapor and causing him to black out for a few moments. Uh, he, he has told us that he, he wasn't out for very long because later on in the encounter, he noticed that after they blacked him out, the two humanoids would attempt to climb the tree. Uh, however, he would awaken before they had gotten very far up, and then he would take measures such as shaking the tree, such as, um, you know, making sure that they wouldn't reach him, uh, that he would cause them to, to fall back. So uh, the blackout times were not very long. But as I mentioned, they continued all throughout the night. Now, the only thing that he had to fight back with, he had very few weapons at his disposal or, or anything that could be used as a weapon. He did have his 60-pound recurve wooden bow with a 28-inch pull, and that's a pretty significant weapon especially when it's fired at close range, an arrow coming out of, of a 60-pound bow uh, has about the same velocity, uh, velocity as a rifle shot. Uh, but the problem was he only had three arrows. So in this next clip, um, he's going to talk about how he decided to take the offensive after the gassing incident started. He decided to take the offensive and use the major weapon that he had at his disposal which was a low-tech bow and three arrows. And we're going to hear that in this next clip. So I, I had a 60-pound bow, which is a very high velocity. And I, I shot, uh, seeing, seeing how the robot, the only thing that was causing me harm, I shot the chest area. And it has the velocity of a rifle at that at that distance, because I'm only about seven eight feet from him. And it, when I hit the chest, the sparks would fly like electrical, like an arc welder kind of. And then that uh, that robot backed up and almost knocked him down. He's, kind of fell back against the rock and the two at the, at the bottom took off and headed to, for the brush and stood out there about 30 feet from me and uh, then uh, I shot uh, two more arrows and it was about the same time sequence that uh, these uh, two humanoids would, every time I'd shoot, they'd go back up into the, the brush, just out, of, just almost out of sight from me. How strange! You know, this this whole incident is kind of reminding me of the uh, the little green man in Kentucky, uh, you know, incident in the fifties. Uh, that. Uh, it's just, you know, these things coming at him all night long with no... Because you would think that, as in other abduction cases, if they wanted him, they could have snatched him. They could have knocked him out like or done like in other abduction cases. But these guys just are so weird. They're just kind of like playing with him all night. It is a strange case in terms of uh, the UFO cases of that time period. But uh, another interesting thing is that uh, we kind of feel as though there was another agenda here on the part of the ETs. Um, they were there 
not expecting to run across any human beings, we think. Um, Mr. Shrum noticed when they first appeared that they were looking around the brush, they were breaking off little pieces or little samples of the surrounding brush. They were engaged in some kind of research or study of the surrounding vegetation, possibly the surrounding mineral um, deposits. We don't know for sure what they were doing, but apparently it caught them rather by surprise, and they probably were not prepared to deal with the finding of a living human being there in the middle of their area where they had this mission that they were carrying out. And so, however, once it came to their attention that he was there, at least Mr. Shrum got the impression that they decided at some point to add him to their collection of specimens. Mm -hmm. And so, but they didn't seem to have any sort of weapons. He saw no nothing in their possession that could have been construed as a weapon other than, of course, this vapor that they released out of the mouth of the robot-type creature, and they kept releasing at him. Well, the interesting part of this story now, we're getting to really the climax of the battle, and what happens next is that you know, he decided to target the robot creature, which was releasing the gas, he decided to target that with his arrows, but unfortunately all three arrows bounced harmlessly off the robot's thick um, suit uh, or whatever covering, outer covering it had. He, uh, Mr. Shrum felt that he could have done a lot more damage uh, to the humanoids if he had targeted them. However, at this point in the encounter, the humanoids had not made any sort of aggressive move toward him. The only... Uh, menacing part of the encounter at that point was the robots releasing the gas. So that's why he did. He decided not to target the humanoids. And every time he would shoot at the robot, as he said in that last audio clip, the humanoids would move away back out into the brush. Well, what happened next is he decided that he would, um, since he was out of arrows, he would start throwing fire, uh, he would light things on fire and throw it down at them. He would do everything in his power to try to keep them from um, their apparent attempts to abduct him. So in this next clip, we're going to hear about his efforts to throw fire, um, set things on fire, and throw it down at the at the ETs. Then I, I ran out of uh, arrows. So I only had three left, and uh, I started, I thought, well, I had, that's when pomade hair, <laughs> it just, I mean, the, the cap I had on was just soaked with oil. This is for your hair? Probably. Yeah, oh, from my hair, yeah, 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 yeah pomade. And uh, they, uh, I always carried uh, all kinds of books of matches with me when I hunted and so I lit that cap and it just blazed up and I dropped it down the base of the tree and just in that instant they they moved back about 12 15 feet and the the I I glanced over at the the ship that was uh over the canyon kind of almost level with me and it was almost out of sight it was just like a star it moved that fast, wow. just in that second. So then I got the idea that they're scared of fire. So I I burned everything but my T-shirt and my jeans. And uh, come to find out later on that, that it was 32 degrees out, and I was shaking and kind of exp overexposed for the weather. And I at one time I threw... Uh, I had a bunch of change, and I threw it down, and they they all kind of gathered around it. Well, after I uh, shot my or, or started burning stuff and throwing it down, and I even uh, uh, tied some some of my shirt that I ripped up. Uh, 
to a compass so I could try to hit some brush because there wasn't nothing right underneath the tree. And then uh, I caught a little pile of brush on fire. I figured that would bring the cavalry. <laughs> But uh, when I run out of stuff to burn, I headed for the top of the tree, and then then I, I, uh, it was a pretty sparse tree I could see down to the ground, and I broke off the top and threw it down, and and any time I throw down or or shake the tree, these humanoids would back up. Wow, what an adventure. I mean, this needs to get made into a movie, and I love this part here where it's kind of a sign of the times where, you know, his hair is greased up, and so yeah. that grease is in his cap, so he lights his cap on fire and, and drops it. Yeah, he was very resourceful. Can you hear me uh, now? A little bit. You're a little low, but... Okay. Um, get, uh, at, I mean, the story goes on. There's a lot. There's still a lot more detail that, unfortunately, we're not able to present but because of the time but um something very significant happened and i was wondering no if you would mind talking about the other robot creature that showed up oh yes uh, the two robots at first there was only the one that came and was releasing the vapor but then another robot creature showed up uh toward the tail end of this encounter and uh the two robots faced each other under the base of the tree and this strange bolt of like lightning uh, streaked across from one robot to the other and then would bounce back and forth. And there was this, um, he described it like um, watching a welder's arc. It was very intensely bright. It was flashing between the chests of these two robot creatures. And then an immense cloud of vapor, much larger than the small puffs that had uh, come up to the tree before, this immense cloud of vapor came up toward him from this, uh, this activity that was going on between the two robots, and that finally caused him to black out for a much longer period of time than before. And in fact, when he woke up from that one, uh, everything was, was over and the creatures and the craft were gone. So we're going to hear uh, the witness say this in uh, clip number 550, which is the final gassing. After I went to the top of the tree, I, I had the, a military belt, and I moved it out to the last hitch and, and put it around me and the, and the tree. So in case I did get gassed, they wouldn't... <laughs> I wouldn't fall down, and then, uh, I, like I said, I threw chains down and everything to try to distract them, and then finally, they, uh, these two humanoids stepped back from the tree, and another robot came, and there was two, just, uh, uh, about the same place that the two uh, humanoids were, and this, they stood facing each other, and the flames, just like uh, lightning, and it br real, real bright, and just came between them, and uh, then I, I it, the gas was so thick coming up the tree that it it, it, it would uh, dissipate just about the time I got to me. But then that's when I'd start to uh, gas for air. And and then when I woke up from that, is uh, it was light, but the sun hadn't come up yet. And uh, I was just hanging by my belt my head down, my feet down, and they were gone. Well, I knew I made it. <laughs> I lived through the night. It, just go back. Did you did you fall asleep, or I mean, or this gas? It, was it over? Did it overwhelm you? Uh, yeah, that's when it just it, it completely engulfed the whole tree and and got up to me. And at I don't know how long I was 
I was out, but it was just, uh, it was, you could see just a, a dim glow of the sun in the, on the clouds and stuff, not cloud, but in the sky. And then, uh, when I woke up, it was light, but the sun hadn't come up yet. Wow. So, yeah, we've got about five minutes or so um, to talk about what happened in the aftermath, but finally it's over. So then was he able to climb down and, and reunite with his friends? Yeah, we actually have enough uh, of this story left to do a whole other hour, so we'll have I'm to sure. be back. <laughs> we'll have to come back later. But basically, uh, he did come down from the tree. His buddies saw that he was in a very distraught uh, condition. He was extremely tired. In fact, he slept for six hours before they could get anything further out of him. Wow. And also, he found out that one of his buddies, Vincent Alvarez, um, who later gave a written affidavit, had seen the initial entry of the mothership uh, from out of the Earth's atmosphere coming down um, through the sky. And he saw it, he saw the object, and he testified to that later on to further um, bolster. Uh, what Mr. Shrum had witnessed. And so uh, when he got home, his wife saw what a horrible state uh, Mr. Shrum was. Today, you know, what he, what he experienced uh, for months and years afterward, today would be called post-traumatic stress syndrome. But in the early 60s, of course, that phrase hadn't been um, coined yet. And But really, he had a horrible time of it for a long time, and then uh, the worst part of it was when the Air Force became involved, some investigators were sent to him from Wright-Patterson Air Base um, in Dayton, Ohio, and they tried to convince him that what he saw out in that forest had a conventional explanation. They proposed several scenarios, including that it was a troop of Boy Scouts that was out playing pranks on people, uh, that was one possible explanation. Hmm. And the other one was that it could have been some uh, Japanese soldiers left over from World War II. And mind you, this was 1964, so that was a long time after <laughs> right. World War II. That were still wandering around the Tahoe National Forest causing trouble for any Americans they oh ran into. Oh my gosh, into. using superpowers of some sort. So, I mean, the story becomes really bizarre. And um, the other interesting thing uh, just to summarize quickly, is that uh, Mr. Shrum was deeply affected uh, by what happened, of course, and there seemed to be a psychological connection with these beings that he experienced later in life. There was an episode where he and his family were sitting at a campfire uh, out camping one evening when all of a sudden he heard this intense screeching in his ears that only he could hear. And everybody sitting around the campfire, his family and his friends, saw him turn and look at a ridge off in the distance. And then a few moments afterward, a UFO came zooming over the ridge and right above their heads. All of them saw it. And later on, they talked to him and told him, how did you know to turn? And he said, I knew they were coming, and I was afraid they were coming for me. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, uh the profound statement that he made at the very end of his interview, I asked him, well, how, how did you feel or what do you think it was this whole outcome? And he said, it's as I won. It's as they didn't take me. And that struck me. You're right. Well, has he ever done any sort of regression to find out what happened while he was blacked out? Yes, we didn't have a chance to speak a lot about this, but after, you know, during that final blackout period, which was several hours in length before he came to, and it was, well, it, it, you know, it, it was a, a longer period of time than his other blackouts. We don't know the exact amount of time. Uh, but he was very concerned that during that final blackout period that they had actually reached him, that they had climbed up and reached him and possibly done things to him. He was very, very concerned, and that was part of the great stress and trauma that he experienced for years afterward. But it turned out that when it, when they did, um, Paul Cerny arranged for a uh, 
a doctor to come and do a session of regressive hypnotherapy with him. They went back. They took him back. They um, they put his fears aside by telling him that he was an observer only, looking down at the scene. He was not actually a participant in it. And uh, once he calmed down and he could analyze everything, then he was made to realize, or it became clear to him, that they never reached him. Uh, there were no further attempts to reach him after that. They apparently finished whatever mission they were on, and then they left, and he was left unmolested, hanging there at the top of this pine tree. Wow, this is a fascinating story, and thank you guys so much for also providing these audio clips, because it adds so much to be able to hear from the witness himself, you know, hearing his inflections and uh, recalling everything, and it, like it seems like he's here with us, so... Uh, you know, you talked about how there's a lot more to the story, but that's a good plug for the book because people can go to roswellbooks.com and order the book and read what else there was with the story. That's correct. Or you can just do a search for it on Amazon uh, or barnesandnoble.com, and it's Aliens in the Forest. It's, uh, it, there's a lot of more detail uh, in the book, and we've got a lot of the documents that, that Paul Cerny collected about the case, a lot of the early um, detailed reports and so forth, and uh, probably close to 100 illustrations, maps, uh, and other graphics. So it's a very enjoyable. We've gotten really positive comments from from our reviewers so far. Great. So what's up next for you guys? Working on new projects? We're going to revisit the uh, Robert Willingham UFO encounter near Del Rio, Texas in 1955. Uh, we um, we uh, wrote a book called The Other Roswell a few years back, and some interesting new information has come forward in this case. Uh, the witness has shared with us information that he did not feel comfortable sharing with us when we did the first edition of the book. So we're going to be issuing a new edition, which contains a lot more information uh, from the eyewitness, uh, Colonel Robert Willingham. All right, great. Ruben, did you want to add? Um, can you hear me now? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> oh, uh, just, just, I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to participate. No just problem. Just, just coughing my head off here in the background. But, um, yeah, uh, as Noe has mentioned, we're going back to some of our books and uh updating them because there's always new information that comes along, even some additional information from our first book, Mexico's Roswell. There's some interesting information that has also come come to us. So we really hope that um, the audience had enjoyed this interview and get a copy of our book, and we're, we're always uh, open to any uh, feedback. All right. I'm sure they did. I think this was fascinating. It's just I'm kind of overwhelmed myself, and I can't wait to review the story. I think it's so incredible. It's a fascinating, um, it's an incredible story. So uh, it, it's just mind-blowing. So it's great. Thank you guys so much. It's always great to have you on. You guys are, are, well, there's a lot of friends out there in the field, and you guys are certainly some of my best buddies out there. So it's great to hear from you guys. Uh, thank you so much for making time to come on the show and talk about this incredible story. Thank you very much, Alejandro, and have a great 2012, man. It's a whole new year for us. You too. I think it's going to be a good one. I'm excited.